It is back! Super Heavy Booster 9 rolls to the launch site. Can Starship revolutionize the space industry? And if so, how? Vulcan Centaur is getting closer to its launch and Chandrayaan 3 lands on the moon. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship Update. Launch preparations are in full swing at Starbase. Every day we're inching closer to that long-awaited second launch. Once Starship does finally launch and reach its orbit, it will open the gate for almost limitless possibilities. Wanna know some of them? Stay with me. This time our journey through Starbase kicks off not at the launch complex, but rather at the build site. Less than three weeks ago, following a series of tests, Super Heavy Booster 9 was moved to the first mega bay. Soon after, it was outfitted with the much anticipated hot staging ring or vented interstage as SpaceX calls it. We delved into its function in our last video, so suffice it to say it was lifted with a crane and secured by the trio of clamps atop the booster. With fitting complete and SpaceX releasing some awe-inspiring pictures, this prototype looked ready to return to the launch site, hopefully for the last time. We were there for its initial movements on August 21st, and finally Super Heavy made its grand exit from the bay atop two SPM transporters the following day. SpaceX rarely wastes any time, so merely hours later Booster 9 was cradled in Mechazilla's arms, subsequently being raised onto the orbital launch mount. Here is a fun question for you. Can you tell what sets this rollout apart from the previous ones, excluding the hot staging ring of course? Leave your observations down in the comments. If you're drawing a blank, take a close look at the engine section. That is right, this time the engines were wrapped in protective covers. This sneaky approach left us speculating if there were any engine replacements. Intriguingly, Booster 7 also donned engine covers during its last journey to the launch pad. Coincidence or a subtle indicator that we are incredibly close to the launch? Shortly after placing the prototype on the OLM, SpaceX graced us with more mesmerizing images of the event. You have got to give them credit, they've been on a roll lately with both the amount and quality of their shots. Even Elon Musk chimed in, sharing these same photos with the caption next Starship launch soon. Though he does have a liking for using that phrase. Take it with a grain of salt, SpaceX is almost ready though, and that's an extremely good sign. You may be pondering what's next on the schedule, a direct leap to a static fire test? Great question, I'd personally wager we'll first witness a spin prime test. Although we're fairly confident the engines are operational, a spin prime serves as a stage zero examination. It's especially likely considering the recent flurry of Raptor quick disconnect purges. Subsequent to that, either on the same day or within a few days, we anticipate another 33 engine static fire. Considering past static fires such as the one before the Booster 7 Ship 24 flight, it's plausible that even a less than perfect test might not deter SpaceX from progressing with the campaign. Next on the agenda, we anticipate the ship will journey to the launch site to be mated with its booster. For Booster 9, the designated ship carries the serial number 25. Given that Ship 24 didn't actually undergo any testing during the last flight, both vehicles are nearly identical. Currently, Ship 25 is parked at the Rocket Garden, where SpaceX engineers are busy adding engine shielding and attaching heat tiles over the crane lifting points used earlier. Once ship and booster are stacked, a swift wet dress rehearsal would close up the testing phase, putting Starship in the ready for launch mode. Do you know what a wet dress rehearsal really is? Essentially, it mimics a launch sequence, excluding the engine ignition. Fuel tanks get filled, engines are chilled, and the countdown advances but halts just before engine startup. This rehearsal is often the final pre-launch test. Ideally, you'd perform it only once due to the amount of propellant boiled off, which then needs to be replenished. Not all of it can be recycled. Previously, the earliest possible launch date was August 31st, but the newly released Notmar notice now states a new date, September 8th. I doubt that, looking at what's left to do, anyone actually believed in the August launch, so it's nice that we finally have a more realistic date. 
Here at What About It, we often focus on the current state of the Starship program, but occasionally it's also worth considering its long-term impact. Have you ever wondered how exactly Starship could become a game changer for the space industry? What's that giant rocket good for anyway? Recently, Bryce Tech published an intriguing report on the status of orbital launches for the second quarter of 2023. I strongly recommend reading the entire report, but I do have the essentials here for you. What really caught my eye was the payload mass each organization managed to get to orbit. This will be good. In the reverse order, Russia comes in third with 8 metric tons or 17,600 pounds of cargo, followed by China, which lofted an impressive 31 metric tons or 68,300 pounds to space. However, SpaceX takes the cake. In just the second quarter of 2023 alone, they've catapulted an astounding 214 metric tons or 469,500 pounds of cargo into orbit. You gotta digest that number. For context, that's nearly the combined tonnage of all other organizations involved worldwide and times four. And here is the kicker. All this was achieved solely with Falcon 9. Just imagine the quantum leap in capabilities once Starship becomes operational. Estimating Starship's actual cargo capacity is a bit of a tough task. Elon Musk's figures have evolved over time, with the latest suggesting that Starship could lift between 250 and 300 tons to orbit in its expendable configuration. To be cautious, let's work with the frequently cited 150 tons or 330,600 pounds in fully reusable mode. That would mean you'd only need two reusable starships to carry all the world's cargo launched in the second quarter of 2023 to a nice and stable orbit. While it is true that payload volume, not just mass, would be a constraint, the very thought is staggering. Take the Starlink constellation as another example. The mass of Starlink V1.0 satellites is around 260 kilograms or 570 pounds. V1.5 satellites weigh about 300 kilograms or 660 pounds. Finally, the newer V2 mini sets are around 800 kilograms or 1760 pounds. Why? Why can't we just have one system of measurements? To not bore you to death with the calculations, this adds up to roughly 1,550 tons or 3.4 million pounds of Starlink hardware. To equal the mass sent up over four years of Starlink missions, you'd only need 11 Starship launches. When SpaceX rolls out its V2.0 Starlink satellites, a single Starship could theoretically carry up to 120 V2 satellites or nearly 190 mini Starlinks. In comparison, a Falcon 9 can carry only 22 minis. Starship could also be an attractive option for other mega constellations, such as Jeff Bezos' project Kuiper. Their plan is to launch 3,200 satellites, each weighing around 600 kilograms or 1,320 pounds. Instead of requiring 83 launches from providers like ULA, Blue Origin, and Arian Space, Kuiper could achieve the same with just 13 Starship flights. Although that scenario is highly unlikely for obvious reasons. Volume is, of course, another consideration. While Falcon 9's payload fairing offers roughly 250 cubic meters or 8,820 cubic feet of space, Starship's payload bay boasts about 1,000 cubic meters or 35,300 cubic feet, quadruple the volume. This is a crucial factor for mass constellations, but as technology advances, satellites are becoming more and more compact. On the other hand, the considerable payload volume also offers the freedom to think big, literally. SpaceX is rumored to already be working on a telescope based on the Starship platform, and its enormous payload bay could open up a myriad of possibilities for large-scale projects. Imagine a swarm telescope made up of thousands of small satellites working together, for example. The bottom line, Starship could revolutionize not just how much, but what kind of payloads we send to space. NASA has already shown massive interest in a Starship variant tailored for space stations. Likewise, VAST, the company behind the Haven 1 space station, is exploring ambitious designs like a 100-meter spin-stick station comprised of seven starships. 
such a structure would be able to generate artificial gravity. It is not too far-fetched to imagine future starships assembling colossal space vehicles in orbit for missions to Jupiter or even beyond, as if pulled straight from a sci-fi movie. The key question that remains unanswered is, will the industry fully make use of Starship's capabilities? It is a challenging question. Once Starship becomes operational and drives down launch costs much like Falcon 9 did, a variety of outcomes could emerge. It's almost certain that Starship would dominate the small and medium satellite launch market. We've seen glimpses of this potential with Falcon 9's transporter missions, which send up not one major payload, but multiple smaller ones. Picture that, but scaled up to thousands of satellites. The affordability of these missions could be a game-changer, potentially enabling every university to have its own small satellite program. The payload capacity could also spur innovation in satellite design. Picture space factories that utilize zero-gravity environments to manufacture things like special medicine. Even if, for some reason, Starship doesn't see widespread adoption, it still has a solid business case in the form of Starlink. Recent reports suggest SpaceX is turning profitable, and Gwyn Shotwell has confirmed that Starlink is generating positive cash flow. With Starship, SpaceX could speed up its satellite deployments, attracting even more users to Starlink. As of May, the constellation boasted 1.5 million customers. Even if all were subscribed to the lowest $100 tier, that would equate to $150 million in monthly revenue. Not to mention that 150,000 new users are signing up each month. Should Starship achieve a launch cadence comparable to only Falcon 9, the total mass lifted to orbit by other providers could become nothing more than a rounding error. Starship isn't just a next-generation launch vehicle. It's a platform that could redefine what's possible in space exploration and utilization. What do you think? Will Starship change the way we think about space? Are we going to start sending even more ambitious missions even further into the solar system? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. I love reading them. I also have an important task for you today. I've heard numerous reports from subscribers that YouTube unsubscribed them from Y without them even noticing or wanting it. Please go check if you're still subscribed even if you were subscribed already, otherwise you'll think we're lazy even though we put out tons of content without you noticing. And while you're at it, hit that like button, share this video with your family and friends and consider becoming a Y supporter. For as low as a dollar per month, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, high quality photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access, you decide what you want to give. The link to our Patreon page is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help fulfill dreams for our team. We can't thank you enough. You rock. All right, ready for some more epic space news before we get to the Indian moon landing. Are you aware of SpaceX's most recent milestone? On August 16th, SpaceX executed another routine Starlink mission. The Falcon 9 rocket carried 22 of the latest Starlink V2 mini satellites. As of now, this is the only version of Starlink satellites in active deployment as the V1.5 series concluded with Group 515 in July. So far, so good. The mission took off smoothly from Slick 40 and marked the 13th flight of Booster B-1067. The first stage then made a successful landing on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. Then, on August 22nd, yet another mission took place. Launching from Vandenberg's Slick 4E, a different Falcon 9 rocket carried 21 Starlink satellites. This mission, of course, was another triumph, marking the 15th flight for Booster B-1061, which touched down safely on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship. So what's the big deal, Felix? It's just another Starlink launch, right? Well, not exactly. This marked the 100th dedicated Starlink mission. The journey began back in February 2018 with the launch of two prototype satellites called Tintin A and B. These prototypes served as test beds for essential components like phased array antennas and propulsion systems that would later be incorporated into Starlink's design. A year later, in May 2019, the first batch of 60 Starlink V0.9 satellites was sent into space. 
These satellites helped validate the production design and test functionalities like Earth communication and deorbit maneuvers. By November we saw the inaugural launch of the operational V1.0 satellites, enabling the first customer signups and demonstrating the viability of the Starlink constellation. However, these satellites had a significant limitation. They couldn't communicate with each other. I still remember the headlines claiming that Starlink would never become a competition. This made the global internet coverage, as promised by Elon Musk, impossible without ground stations. Not the easiest thing to deploy in remote areas like, for example, Antarctica. Everything changed in June 2021 when SpaceX launched its first full set of V1.5 satellites. These were game changers, equipped with laser terminals that enabled them to communicate directly with each other, bypassing the need for ground stations. This innovation enabled global network access, well, provided you are in a country that hasn't restricted it. Fast forward to February of this year, SpaceX unveiled the next generation V2.0 mini satellites. These are not just incremental upgrades, they are complete redesigns, enabling much higher data throughput. However, these enhanced capabilities come at a cost, increased weight due to additional hardware like a second solar panel. This has limited Falcon 9's carrying capacity to around 22 of these new satellites and sometimes, depending on the orbit, as few as 15. But this is a transitional phase. Once Starship becomes operational, we can expect to see launches of the full-sized V2 satellites, which weigh over a ton and are double the size of their predecessors. As of now, the Starlink constellation contains over 4,600 satellites, with the next launches pushing that number past the 5,000 milestone. While SpaceX is executing launches at an almost daily cadence, their competitor, United Launch Alliance, is inching closer to launching their Falcon 9 rival, the mighty Vulcan Centaur. You may remember from earlier episodes, Vulcan Centaur's development journey has had some hiccups. Initially projected for a 2021 debut, the launch was delayed, a not uncommon occurrence in the complex world of rocket engineering, as evidenced by other latecomers, including Starship. The delays were mainly caused by the challenges with Blue Origin's BE-4 engine and additional time required by Astrobotic to prepare their lunar lander. After the engines finally arrived, the rocket was stacked and the testing phase began. In March, both the Vulcan Booster and its Centaur 5 upper stage successfully passed cryogenic pressure tests. Not long after, a significant hiccup occurred that temporarily halted the entire test campaign. While conducting pressure tests of the second stage at the Marshall Space Flight Center, the test article unexpectedly leaked. The escaping vapors ignited, resulting in a massive fireball. Thanks to ULA CEO Tori Bruno, we even have the footage of this scary incident. After an in-depth investigation, it was discovered that the issue stemmed from inadequate welds at the forward dome of the second stage, causing the tank to leak. Worryingly, this design fault also plagued the Centaur 5 located in Florida. Despite these setbacks, ULA resumed testing in May, successfully simulating launch conditions and igniting the twin BE-4 engines. Subsequently, the upper stage of Vulcan was de-stacked and returned to ULA's manufacturing facility in Decatur, Alabama. There, a new forward dome was manufactured, featuring added scene doublers to hopefully resolve the weakness. Later, it was welded with the existing tank structure, and now the tank awaits its insulating layer before it's ready for shipment back to Florida. Upon its return, some additional tests will likely be necessary, but Tori Bruno is optimistic about a launch before year's end. When Vulcan does finally take to the skies, it will be a spectacle to watch. After all, it's not every day that a company aims for the moon on its maiden voyage. And that is precisely the ambition with Astrobotic's Peregrine Lander, designed to deliver up to 90 kilograms or around 200 pounds of payloads from various companies directly to the lunar surface. Initially, this mission was also slated to carry two prototypes of Kuiper satellites, Amazon's answer to Starlink. However, due to the prolonged delays, these satellites were reassigned to one of the remaining Atlas V rockets. 
Given ULA Atlas V's stellar track record, the odds seem favorable that Vulcan's inaugural flight will be fully successful, a feat that is somewhat rare in the aerospace sector. As we were wrapping up this episode, some breaking news just came in. Chandrayaan-3 has successfully touched down on the moon. One month and nine days after its launch, the spacecraft executed a series of intricate maneuvers to prepare for landing. On August 17th, the lander module detached from the propulsion stage and following two additional burns was set on a trajectory aimed at the lunar surface. The crucial landing phase was planned for August 2023. As the lander descended, its autonomous landing system kicked in, toggling between hovering and descent modes. At precisely 8.34 am Eastern Time, the lander made a gentle touchdown on the moon's surface. This prompted a triumphant reaction from everyone who had been holding their breath, waiting for confirmation of the lander's survival. We are now eagerly awaiting the deployment of the rover sitting hidden inside the lander. The Chandrayaan-3 mission is slated to last 14 days, although, as is often the case with these types of missions, it could very well extend beyond that time frame. Huge congratulations to the team at the Indian Space Research Organization. They've clearly learned valuable lessons from their earlier mission and their success with Chandrayaan-3 is a testament to that growth. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. Link is in the description. And if you want to get even smarter about space and rockets, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. We... Uh, yes. <laughs> Toy point one. August thirty fake for fa fakest. Yeah, it's August thirty fakest. <laughs>